years where I speculate what could have been if history had gone differently. Ah, the Soviet Union, one of the most memed and most murderous regimes to have ever existed. It all began in 1917. A group of Russia's liberal politicians and military leaders, disappointed with the Russian monarch, Tsar Nicholas II, and his handling of the war effort against the Central Powers in World War I, forced Nicholas to abdicate, and in the Russian Empire in the February Revolution, which actually happened in March. Those politicians then established a provisional government with the goal of transitioning Russia into a liberal republic. However, they made one fatal mistake. They chose to continue to fight the Central Powers, believing the war on the Eastern Front could still be won. At that point, the poor and starving Russian people were sick of war, and the decision to stay in the war effectively killed the provisional government's popularity. The Germans, wanting the Russians to drop out of the war, sent the exiled communist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin back to Russia so he could stir up more chaos. Lenin joined up with his revolutionary Marxist faction, the Bolsheviks, and overthrew the provisional government from the then Russian capital city of Petrograd in the October Revolution, which actually happened in November. But the fighting was far from over. The Russian Revolution was but the prelude to the Russian Civil War. On one side, you had the Red Army of the Bolsheviks, but on the other side, there was the White Army, led by Russian Admiral Alexander Kolchak. The Whites were composed of many different factions, including liberals, conservatives, republicans, monarchists, orthodox nationalists, pan-slavists, and even democratic socialists. The only thing which all these groups had in common was that they didn't want Russia to be communists. Thanks to the Bolsheviks controlling the industrial parts of Russia, disunity among the Whites, and only a half-hearted effort by the Allies to stop communism, the Reds were able to come out on top in 1923 establishing the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the first communist state in history. With the Civil War won, the Soviet Union went on to become one of the most repressive regimes of the 20th century, at its worst during the reign of Joseph Stalin from 1927 to 1953. Human rights were hardly ever recognized. Citizens accused of dissent were often sent to forced labor camps known as gulags. The communist practices of collectivization failed to bring the hungerless utopia the people were promised. Instead, communism only made Russia's food situation even worse, resulting in millions of dying by starvation. The Soviet Union became the greatest threat to the West during the Cold War, spreading communism to many different countries. Eventually, the USSR lost the Cold War when it collapsed in 1991. However, its legacy lives on. As the memory of the horrors of the Soviet regime start to fade, Younger generations left disillusioned by the limited economic opportunity in Western countries, but also unable to distinguish capitalism from corporatocracy, the actual problem behind economic inequality, leading to an open embrace of communism. From Marxist organizations rioting through America's streets and even proclaiming independent communes, to that weird kid on your school bus who blasted the Soviet anthem on his phone every day. But could this have been prevented if the Soviet Union never existed? What if the White Army won the Russian Civil War? Okay, so if the Whites are to win the Russian Civil War, all the factions that made up the White Army have to mostly agree upon a common vision for what the future of Russia should be. The best possible ideal for the Whites that would most likely guarantee victory would be a liberal republic, as that was the government the Entente was hoping for Russia to have post-war. Kolchak did in fact agree to establish a republic to the Entente, but it wasn't like the majority of Whites were on board with this plan. So in the alternate timeline, the power of the monarchists, orthodox nationalists, etc. would have to be weaker, while conversely, the influence of the liberals and the republicans would have to be stronger. This would lead to better strategic coordination for the White Army, but it wouldn't be enough. The Entente would still need to get more invested into the Russian Civil War. In our timeline, Entente intervention was just a mess of conflicting strategies and interests before everyone just got bored and left. One of the few loudest voices calling for a serious commitment to fighting in the Russian Civil War on ideological grounds was the then British War Secretary Winston Churchill. 
Churchill pressured the British government to recognize Kolchak's government, but the British Prime Minister at the time, David Lloyd George, was only willing to do so if the United States did, and President Woodrow Wilson, the worst president America ever had, greatly distrusted Kolchak, despite the fact that Kolchak genuinely did not want to seize power over Russia after the war. So let's say that in this alternate timeline, Wilson is able to somehow overcome his idiocy and narcissism for this one issue. The United States recognizes the whites as the legitimate government of Russia, followed by the British, leading to a more concentrated effort by the Entente to remove the Reds. In case neither white Russian unity or greater Entente intervention are enough, let's say that on August 30th, 1918, the assassination attempt on Lenin by socialist revolutionary Fanny Kaplan is successful, depriving the Bolsheviks of his leadership. Coordinating with the whites moving westward into the industrial heartland of Russia, American and British troops would move south from Akhangalisk towards Petrograd and Moscow. Within the following months, the Red Army would be overwhelmed and surrender in 1920, preventing the Soviet Union and creating the Russian Republic. Though the war itself wouldn't quite be over yet, as the Whites would have to deal with the separatist states that broke away from the Russian Empire. In our timeline, after the Central Powers surrendered, the Soviets moved to occupy the territories lost in the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, invading the Baltics, Ukraine, and Poland, starting the Polish-Soviet War. The Reds were able to make it as far as Warsaw before the Polish were able to turn them back. Poland was able to save itself and the Baltics from annexation, but was forced by the Entente to agree to a premature peace, partitioning Belarus and Ukraine with the USSR. In the alternate timeline, the Whites still likely would have moved to retake the Russian territory in Eastern Europe. However, Kolchak agreed to the Entente that Poland would be left alone and remain a sovereign nation. Of course, the Russian incursion into the Baltics and Ukraine would still agitate the Polish, who would still attempt to liberate Ukraine, but would eventually be stopped. Unlike the Reds, the Whites would stop at the Polish border, successfully annexing the Baltics and all of Ukraine. Following the victory of the White Army, Kolchak, who saw himself as a military technician who knew little to nothing about politics, would step down as the supreme ruler of Russia as soon as democratic elections could be held. Of course, given how ever since Russia first came into existence following the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, authoritarianism has always been thoroughly ingrained into Russian culture, so the legitimacy of these elections could be rather shaky, and the power wielded by those in charge might be just a little excessive. Just like the Soviet Union in our timeline, the Russian Republic would also likely resort to send in political dissidents to forced labor camps. That being said, famines caused by the Soviet policy of collectivization, such as the Holodomor, which killed 3.9 million Ukrainians, would never have happened. On another positive note, all the depressing, uniform, Soviet-era architecture would never exist. Russia's rich and vast art and culture would continue to grow and thrive into the mid-20th century, as opposed to being strangled by the Soviet regime in our timeline. Okay, now let's talk about Mongolia. Why? Because of Roman von Ungern Sternberg. Ungern was a baron of the Russian Empire who was kind of insane. He was a staunch monarchist who fought for the Whites during the Russian Civil War. In our timeline, after the Reds defeated the Whites, Ungern and his Asiatic Cavalry Division fled to Mongolia, which was under Chinese control at the time. He proceeded to kick the Chinese out of Mongolia, declaring the Bad Khanate of Mongolia, hoping one day that he would literally restore the Mongol Empire. Yeah, pretty insane. Unfortunately for Ungern, the Soviets invaded Mongolia, executed Ungern, and turned Mongolia into a Soviet puppet state. In the alternate timeline, however, Ungern, upset with the liberal and non-monarchist direction Russia is heading in, still flees to Mongolia and establishes the Bad Khanate. Only this time, the Soviets can't invade and ruin everything, keeping him in power and playing a crucial role in the Chinese warlord era, incorporating parts of northern China into his empire. So without the Soviet Union, would communism ever rise again? Well, unfortunately, yes. Even if communism failed to take hold in Russia, there would still be plenty of followers of Marx and Lenin across the globe. It's also worth mentioning that in order for communism to be proven not to work, it would have to be put into practice. So as long as communism hasn't been put into practice, it might become a more widespread and appealing ideology among working class citizens from a timeline ignorant of its true consequences. So it's really only a matter of time before another country becomes the first communist state, especially once the Great Depression happens. So which country would take Russia's place? France. Here's why. 
France had quite a few leftist political parties in the 1920s and 30s, such as the French Communist Party and the French Section of Workers Internationale, with the latter even managing to form a coalition which won a majority in the French National Assembly on two separate occasions in the interwar period. With that in mind, France likely would be the most accepting of communism more than any other nation in the world at that point. With help from former Soviets fleeing Russia to Western Europe, the French Communist Party could eventually outshine the French section of Workers Internationale, and once the Great Depression hits in 1929, the French Communist Party is set to win the next general election. This new communist regime in France would actually be very similar to the French Revolution, such as quickly forgetting its goals of equality and becoming very tyrannical very fast, suppressing the Catholic Church, and executing anyone deemed counter-revolutionary. France's colonies would become semi-independent communist client states. There would also be plenty of famine, but you probably had already guessed that last one. Now, how does all of this affect World War II? Well, the Nazi party, playing off the German people's hatred for the Treaty of Versailles, invoking anti-Semitism, as well as using fears of communism, domestic and abroad, would still come to power. But these alternate Nazis would have a slightly different worldview than the ones we know. In our timeline, one of Hitler's main goals from the very start was to invade the Soviet Union in order to 1. destroy Bolshevism, and 2. to make living space for the German people to settle. But without the Soviet Union, Hitler's personal worldview would have been definitely reshaped while he was single-handedly creating the Nazi mythos. This alternate Hitler really wouldn't care about Russia. Instead, his main goal would be the complete and utter destruction of France, not only to avenge Germany's defeat in the Great War, but also to destroy French communism which would have come to power shortly before the Nazis did. Hitler would reshape the Nazi mythos, claiming it was Germany's destiny to conquer France, do away with the French people, resettle the German people, and unify Western Europe under the German banner in some sort of recreation of the Carolingian Empire. Sometime in the late 1930s, this alternate Franco-German rivalry would eventually boil over, most likely caused by the German annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938, beginning the Franco-German War. I call it that instead of World War II because it is very unlikely that this war would escalate into a global conflict. Not even Britain would get involved. You see, the British would be horrified by the regimes of both combatants. France and Germany would both be seen as potential rivals to the British Empire so Britain would prefer to stay out of the war and let its rivals destroy each other. Italy, however, would still join the war on the side of the Germans. Now, who would win this conflict? Well, when France had gone up against Germany by itself in the Franco-Prussian War, they lost embarrassingly. The only reason France was able to survive the German onslaught in the First World War was thanks to British intervention on the Western Front. So, based on the historical trends, France would fall to the Germans. As the war in Europe would be concluding, the United States would place an oil embargo on the Empire of Japan to force them to end their war with China. The Japanese are left with three options. A. End the war with China, which would be considered highly dishonorable, so that was never going to happen. B. Strike south, invade the Philippines and the East Indies to get more oil, start in a war with the US and the UK. Or C. Strike north into Russia. In our timeline, the Soviets defeated the Japanese in the Battle of Konkin Gol during their border conflicts over Mongolia in the 1930s. Combined with Japanese fears of Marxism, Japan's leadership became terrified by the prospect of war with Russia and chose to strike south. But in this alternate timeline, the Battle of Konkin Gol would never happen because Mongolia wouldn't be a Russian puppet and a communist power on their border wouldn't even be there to scare Japan. In fact, Ungern had actually collaborated with the Japanese during his reign in our timeline, so in this alternate timeline, the Japanese, wanting Siberian oil, and the Mongolians, wanting to restore monarchism to Russia, would team up, striking north into the Russian Republic, beginning the Second Russo-Japanese War. The Russians would be shocked and start moving their forces across the country to meet the Mongolians and the Japanese. It would be the start of a long, brutal war in Siberia, lasting into the late 1940s. While Ungern's Mongolia would eventually be overwhelmed by the Russians, Japan would have been given enough time and resources to subjugate China and secure its hold over the Russian Far East. Just like the last Russo-Japanese War, the United States would mediate between the two powers and in the conflict. With its newfound surplus in land, resources, and manpower, Japan is left in a much more advantageous position, which would be very helpful in a potential future conflict with the United States in the following decades all while the Nazis are able to maintain and expand their hold on Western Europe. So yeah, things aren't quite looking up for this timeline.
this is where I'll be ending the scenario. My next video to come out will be my year 2 review, where I'll be reviewing the past year of this channel's history. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram. This has been RJM3, Alternate Historian. Have a nice day.